Hi and welcome to this bite size revision session. In this session I'm going to talk to you about oral antral communications and I'm going to talk to you about trying to assess patients and trying to predict those patients who might get an oral antral communication or an OAC. What happens when you take a tooth out and you think there might be an OAC but you're not quite sure? How do we diagnose it? If a patient comes back with some symptoms of an OAC, what symptoms might they be? And then what signs that you might elicit as a clinician when you see that patient and you think there might be an OAC. So how do we confirm that diagnosis? And putting all that together, how do we then manage these patients? And that's really important. So first of all, how do you work out or assess which patients are at risk of an OAC? Sometimes when you look at the periapical radiograph, it might look like the sinus floor is quite close to the apices of the roots. And sometimes that's really difficult to assess because that image is not a three-dimensional picture. So you might think, actually, is it worth getting a cone beam CT scan? I would only say that I would get a cone beam CT scan if it's going to change what I do. So here is a short case study demonstrating a patient who was referred for the extraction of the upper right first molar. This is the periapical that was sent in with the patient and you can quite clearly see that the antrum is quite hazy. Although you can see a nice outline of the antrum around the premolar and the molar, the actual, uh, it's not very clear within the antrum itself. So that would suggest that there is something going on, whether that's inflammatory or there's something more sinister going on within the sinus. And I think an image like this, you would either take an OPT, but actually in this day and age, we'd probably go for a cone beam CT scan if we have that opportunity. Now here you can see the CT scan, and if you look on the top right, you can see that image where the palatal root is within the sinus itself, the mesial root, the mesial buccal most likely there, that looks like there's some bone loss around it, and those changes, the inflammatory changes that we could see, are suggestive that they're related to this. Those with lone standing molars or lone standing premolars, certainly anything that's um, almost edentulous in that arch, they're more likely to have an OAC because there'll be bone resorption around that tooth and you may even get what we call pneumatization of the sinus where the floor drops down and you can see that on this radiograph. Elderly patients or those in older ages, more fragile bone and if it's an upper eight, Again, if it's lone standing, or even those fit and healthy patients with upper eights that you're going to extract, if there's a chunk of bone distal to the eight, sometimes that will fracture at the same time, causing a fractured tuberosity, which is an additional complication, but that may then obviously lead on to an OAC. How do you diagnose an OAC at the time of extraction? I've talked about those patients who are at risk, and it can often be anything from a premolar back to the, the third molar in the maxilla. It's really important to warn patients about OACs, even if you think the risk is low, and talk to them about the communication between the mouth, the sinus, and that then drains into the nose. So if they get an OAC, the kind of signs or symptoms they may get. It's quite rare to get chronic symptoms with an OAC that don't get better but it's something you should mention to your patient. And it's also quite rare for those patients to develop facial pain or atypical facial pain after an OAC. You should be aware that an OAC, if it's not treated and it starts to heal of its own accord, will develop a fistula, which is an oral antral fistula. And a fistula is an epithelial line tract between two cavities. So that would be between the mouth and the sinus. So you'll get what looks like an epithelial line tract. That's different to an OAC and the symptoms are sometimes different. So you take a tooth out, you think, have I got an OAC? Have I not got an OAC? Have a look in the socket. If you can see a black hole into the sinus, then there's your diagnosis. Gently put a fine suction tip up into the socket and sometimes you can hear a change in acoustics. Not always. Be very careful putting instruments up there and obviously if there's a fractured root you want to be very cautious when you try and remove that in case you push that root into the antrum which again is another complication of a displaced root or even tooth into the antrum. So have a look. If you think it's an OAC we'll talk about management in a second. If you have a look and it's, it's a definite OAC then we'll, we'll, we need to manage that. You might think, not quite sure if it's an OAC, so I'm going to give the patient some conservative advice and some medical management. If it's a confirmed OAC, ideally it needs to be closed. It's not an emergency, so if you are in a situation where you don't have the skill or competence to deal with this, then you can manage it medically and you can refer it. You can refer it to an oral surgeon. We don't need to see that patient the same day.
you could give us a call, write in and do a referral and manage the patient appropriately. So medical management of that patient. Medical management involves analgesia, so ideally non-steroidal anti-inflammatories if patients can tolerate those with paracetamol or if just paracetamol alone. Ideally, you don't want to blow their nose for a couple of weeks. And I would say, tell them if they're gonna sneeze, certainly not to stifle that sneeze like that, but just sneeze outwards like a horse. It's really important that patients um, are aware of, of the diagnosis and should be aware of symptoms that not, might develop. So they may start to develop sinusitis-like symptoms or congestion, and that congestion will feel up here. If patients come back with those symptoms of congestion, you want to try and diagnose if it's infective, so if it's a sinusitis. And if you lean forward with sinusitis, you'll feel an increase in pressure in the maxillary sinus. And obviously, if it's spread into the frontal sinus, you will feel it up there as well. So we want a decongestant. You might prescribe a decongestant prophylactically, or just say, get some menthol crystals from the chemist, put them in a bowl of warm water and do some steam inhalations. And that will just keep that congestion at bay. So analgesia, decongestants, and I'm gonna say consider antibiotics. Now that has to be a clinical decision by the clinician on the day of treatment. If you think it warrants antibiotics for whatever reason, whether the, the patient is immunosuppressed, immunocompromised, or you think it was a difficult extraction, it's grotty, there's been infection, I think a short course of antibiotics, then that's your decision. And as long as you can justify that, I don't see a problem with it. It's important to document in the notes why you've prescribed antibiotics. Broad spectrum antibiotics would be appropriate. Anamoxicillin, a penicillin style, if, if the patient can tolerate it. Doxycycline is another good antibiotic, or you may need an alternative to penicillin or doxycycline. Again, when you're prescribing antibiotics, make sure you tell the patients about side effects. So any rashes, anything like that that might develop, are also gastrointestinal problems, such as diarrhea, then the patient needs to stop the antibiotics and contact you or contact their physician. What ideally we don't want to do in the diagnostic criteria is what's called a Valsalva maneuver, where you would ask the patient to hold their nose and blow with their mouth shut to see if they've got an OAC. Now, in my experience, if there is a, a a breach in the bone of the apex of the socket and there's just the Schneiderian membrane lining there, if you do a Valsalva, you will probably perforate that lining and then create an OAC. Ideally, we want to not do that. If there is just the membrane lining there, we want to allow the body to heal and the socket to heal and the gingivae to heal appropriately. So I don't recommend a Valsalva maneuver. I appreciate that some clinicians do, but personally, I think it's potentially gonna cause you more bother. Let's talk about surgical management. If you have the surgical skill to manage this, then the traditional approach would be an advancement flap. And that could either be a buccal advancement flap or a palatal rotation flap. The disadvantage with a buccal advancement flap, you may or may not use the buccal fat pad, is that you reduce the sulcus depth. So depending what the patient's gonna have from a restorative perspective, or if they ever need a denture in the future, you've reduced that sulcus depth. The buccal fat pad is quite helpful for big defects, Sometimes it's only used under a general anaesthetic, and once you access the buccal fat pad, it keeps coming and there's quite a lot of it. Palatal rotation flaps are quite good. Both of these are very technique sensitive. Um, obviously, when you rotate that palatal flap, you're then left with exposed palatal bone. That exposed palatal bone will granulate, but it can be quite sore and uncomfortable. So if you're planning a palatal rotation flap, you may consider a cover plate, where you can put either some copac or a dressing in there just to make the patient's journey a little bit more comfortable. The palatal rotation flap is quite technique sensitive, but does work. What I've started to use in the past five years is platelet-rich fibrin. So you use a membrane made from the PRF and that will seal that socket up. And that works really well actually. And then there's no donor site issues, there's no lock, lack of sulcus depth. And actually it seems to, to give the patients good results. So following on from the case study earlier, the upper right first molar, this is the clinical component. So here we can see the tooth has been extracted in three pieces, the three roots with the crown that fractured off. And as expected from this, 
Clinically, it was quite obvious that it was an oral antral communication, and this was not surprising given the scan and the periapical radiograph. So I chose to use platelet-rich fibrin in this patient, and you can see the clot here that has been spun in the standard centrifuge. Once the clot has been removed from the tube, then you can place it into the casing and flattened into a membrane or used as a plug in the socket. So in this case, I used two clots, one as a plug into the socket itself, and then the other I flattened out into a membrane, and you can see that this membrane has been sutured in situ here with some resorbable sutures. The patient had good healing and a good result overall. So all in all, with any tooth that you think is near the antrum, think about your imaging, think about the patient, think about what you've seen on the imaging, is this likely to create an OAC? If it does, how am I gonna manage it? but also make sure you talk to the patient about an OAC and the signs and symptoms. And if it does occur, then that conversation has already been had and the patient is aware about it, and then you can refer appropriately. Hope that helps on sinuses and OACs. Any queries or questions, just drop me a message and please subscribe to the channel. Thanks very much.